The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, Chapter 16, The Haircut. It had been almost a year since Bruno had come home to find Maria packing his things, and his memories of life in Berlin had almost all faded away. When he thought back, he could remember that Carl and Martin were two of his three best friends for life, but he try as he might, he couldn't remember who the other one was. And then something happened that meant for two days he could leave out with and return to his old house. Grandmother died, and the family had to go home for the funeral. While he was there, Bruno realized he wasn't quite as small as he had been when he left, because he could see over things that he couldn't see over before. And when they stayed in their old house, he could look through the window on the top floor and see across Berlin without having to stand on tiptoes. Bruno hadn't seen his grandmother since leaving Berlin, but he had thought about her every day. The things he remembered most about her were the productions that she and he and Gretel performed at Christmas and birthdays and how she always had the perfect costume to suit whatever role he played. When he thought that he would never be able to do that again, it made him very sad indeed. The two days they spent in Berlin were also very sad ones. There was the funeral, and Bruno and Gretel and father and mother and grandfather sat in the front row, father wearing his most impressive uniform, the starched, impressed one with the decorations. The father was particularly sad. Mother told Bruno because he had fought with grandmother and they hadn't made it up before she died. There were a lot of wreaths delivered to the church, and Father was proud of the fact that one of them had been sent by the Fury. But when Mother heard, she said that Grandmother would have turned, would turn in her grave if she knew it were there. Bruno felt almost glad when they returned to Outwith. The house there had become his home now, and he had stopped worrying about the fact that it only had three floors rather than five, and it didn't bother him so much that the soldiers came and went as if they owned the place. It slowly dawned on him that things weren't too bad there after all, especially since he'd met Schmuel. He knew that there were many things he should be happy about, like the fact that mother and father seemed cheerful all the time now, and mother didn't have to take as many of her afternoon naps or medicinal sherries. And Gretel was going through a phase, mother's words, and tended to keep out of his way. There was also the fact that Lieutenant Cotler had been transferred away from Outwith and wasn't around to make Bruno feel angry and upset all the time. His departure had come about very suddenly, and there had been a lot of shouting between father and mother about it late at night. But he was gone, and that was for sure, and he wasn't coming back. And Gretel was inconsolable. That was something else to be happy about. No one called him Little Man anymore. But the best thing was that he had a friend called Schmuel. He enjoyed walking along the fence every afternoon and was pleased to see that his friend seemed a lot happier these days. And his eyes didn't seem so sunken, although his body was still ridiculously skinny and his face unpleasantly gray. One day, while sitting opposite him at their usual place, Brenna remarked, This is the strangest friendship I've ever had. Why? asked Schmuel. Because every other boy I've been friends with has been somebody that I've been able to play with, he replied. And we never get to play together. All we get to do is sit here and talk. I like sitting here and talking, said Schmuel. Well, I do of co- too, of course, said Bruno, but it's a pity we can't do something more exciting from time to time. A little bit of exploring, perhaps, or a game of football. <laughs> We've never even seen each other without all this wire fencing in the way. Bruno often made comments like this because he wanted to pretend that the incident a few months earlier when he had denied his friendship with Schmuel had never taken place. It still preyed on his mind and made him feel bad about himself although Schmuel, to his credit, seemed to have forgotten all about it. Maybe someday we will, said Schmuel, if they ever let us out. Bruno started to think more and more about the two sides of the fence and the reason it was there in the first place. He considered speaking to father or mother about it, but suspected that they would either be angry with him for mentioning it or tell him something unpleasant about Schmuel and his family. 
So instead, he did something quite unusual. He decided to talk to the hopeless case. Gretel's room had changed quite considerably since the last time he'd been there. For one thing, there wasn't a single doll in sight. One afternoon, a month or so earlier, around the time that Lieutenant Kotler had left out with, Gretel had decided that she didn't like dolls anymore and had put them all into four large bags and thrown them away. In their place, she had hung up maps of Europe that father had given her, and every day she put little pins into them and moved the pins around constantly after consulting the daily newspaper. Bruno thought she might be going mad, but still, she didn't tease him or bully him as much as she used to, so he thought there could be no harm in talking to her. Hello, he said, knocking politely on her door, because he knew how angry she always got if he just went in. What do you want? asked Gretel, who was sitting at her dressing table, experimenting with her hair. Nothing, said Bruno. Then go away. Bruno nodded, but came inside anyway and sat down on the side of the bed. Gretel watched him from out of the side of her eyes, but didn't say anything. Gretel, he said finally, can I ask you something? If you make it quick, she said. Everything here at Outwith, he began, but she interrupted him immediately. <laughs> it's not called out with Bruno, she said angrily, as if this was the worst possible mistake anyone had ever made in the history of the world. Why can't you pronounce it right? It is called out with, he protested. It's not, she insisted, pronouncing the name of the camp correctly for him. Bruno frowned and shrugged his shoulders at the same time. But that's what I said, he said. No, it's not. Anyway, I'm not going to argue with you, said Gretel, losing her patience already, for she had very little of it to begin with. What is it, anyway? What do you want to know? I want to know about the fence, he said firmly, deciding that this was the most important thing to begin with. I want to know why it's there. Gretel turned round in her chair and looked at him curiously. You mean you don't know? she asked. No, said Bruno. I don't understand why we're not allowed on the other side of it. What's so wrong with us that we can't go over there and play? Gretel stared at him and then suddenly started laughing, only stopping when she saw that Bruno was being perfectly serious. Bruno, she said in a childish voice, as if this was the most obvious thing in the world. The fence isn't there to stop us from going over there. It's to stop them from coming over here. Bruno considered this, but it didn't make things any clearer. But why? he asked. Because they have to be kept together, explained Gretel. With their families, you mean? Well, yes, with their families, but with their own kind, too. What do you mean, their own kind? Gretel sighed and shook her head. With the other Jews, Bruno, didn't you know that? That's why they have to be kept together. They can't mix with us. Jews, said Bruno, testing the word out. He quite liked the way it sounded. Jews, he repeated. All the people over that side of the fence are Jews. Yes, that's right, said Gretel. Are, are we Jews? Gretel opened her mouth wide as if she had been slapped in the face. No, Bruno, she said. No, we most certainly are not. And you shouldn't even say something like that. But why not? What are we then? We're, began Gretel. But then she had to stop and think about it. We're, she repeated. But she wasn't quite sure what the answer to this question really was. Well, we're not Jews, she said finally. I know we're not, said Bruno in frustration. I'm asking you, if we're not Jews, what are we instead? We're the opposite, said Gretel, answering quickly and sounding a lot more satisfied with this answer. Yeah, that's it. We're the opposite. All right, said Bruno, pleased that he had, had it settled in his head at last. And the opposite live on this side of the fence and the Jews live on that. That's right, Bruno. Don't the Jews like the opposite then? No, it's us who don't like them, stupid. 
Bruno frowned. Gretel had been told time and time again that she wasn't allowed to call him stupid, but she still persisted with it. Well, why don't we like them? he asked. Because they're Jews, said Gretel. I see. And the opposite and the Jews don't get along. No, Bruno, said Gretel. But she said this slowly because she had discovered something unusual in her hair and was examining it carefully. Well, can't someone just get them together and... Bruno was interrupted by the sound of Gretel breaking into a piercing scream, one that woke Mother up from her afternoon nap and brought her running into the bedroom to find out which of her children had murdered the other one. While experimenting with her hair, Gretel had found a tiny egg no bigger than the top of a pen. She showed it to Mother, who looked through her hair, pulling strands of it apart quickly before marching over to Bruno and doing the same thing to him. Oh, I don't believe it, said Mother angrily. I knew something would happen in a place like this. <laughs> it turned out that both Gretel and Bruno had lice in their hair, and Gretel had to be treated with a special shampoo that smelled horrible. And afterwards, she sat in her room for hours on end, crying her eyes out. Bruno had the shampoo as well, but then father decided that the best thing was for him to start afresh and he got a razor and shaved all Bruno's hair off which made Bruno cry. It didn't take long and he hated seeing all his hair float down from his head and land on the floor at his feet but father said it had to be done. Afterwards Bruno looked at himself in the bathroom mirror and he felt sick. His entire head looked misshapen now that he was bald and his eyes looked too big for his face. He was almost scared of his own reflection. Don't worry, Father reassured him. It'll grow back. It'll only take a few weeks. It's a f the filth around here that did it, said Mother. If some people could only see the effect this place is having on all of us. When he saw himself in the mirror, Bruno couldn't help but think how much like Schmuel he looked now and wondered whether all the people on that side of the fence had lice as well. And that was why all their heads were shaved too. When he saw his friend the next day, <laughs> Schmuel started to laugh at Bruno's appearance, which didn't do a lot for his dwindling self-confidence. I look just like you now, said Bruno sadly, as if this was a terrible thing to admit. Well, only fatter, admitted Schmuel. And that's the end of chapter 16.